Good evening, everybody. I entitled this talk, Life is Fleeting, Yama and Niyama, Part 2. It wasn't the original title. The original title was Living According to Your Values, Yama and Niyama, Part 2. I changed the title last night when I sat down to begin to collect some thoughts. And as I was sitting there, I got a call from California to tell me that a very dear friend had just passed on Monday. And as many of us here know, a very beloved member of our community passed on Wednesday. So the fleeting nature of our transient existence was very strong in my heart and mind. Gurudev has said that God sends three messengers to remind us that life is fleeting. The first is gray hair. <laughs> I'm looking around the room here. Who has received that messenger? The second messenger is loss of teeth. When we're a baby, we start out quite innocent and toothless. Then we identify, identify, develop the ego sense, and then as we approach the later years of our life, we start de-dentifying. <laughs> Hopefully the ego begins to get a little smaller as well. Who has been visited by that messenger? <laughs> Anyone? And the third messenger, what is she saying? <laughs> Can anyone hear her? The third messenger. And the idea is nature, through our very physiology and anatomy, is giving us a little tap on the shoulder, saying, time is passing. Get it together. <laughs> The Tarukaral, a great scripture from South India, compares a life to a tree. Every day is like an ax that comes and goes and takes a nick out of that tree. And none of us ever knows when that last critical will happen and the tree of our life will come tumbling down. Our beloved Yanam was one of the pioneers of this community. She came to Sri Gurudev in the 70s. I met her then in California. She helped to establish the Integral Yoga Organization, and she helped to nurture its growth all these many decades. She was a sole companion for many of us, a bright light, and a source of deep wisdom and insight. And she will be dearly missed by many. And I wanted to just spend a moment to honor her memory and remember the gift of her presence in all of our lives. Those of you who love Lotus, one of the things she contributed to the organization, she was the co-coordinator of the grand celebration to Open Lotus in 1986. Her contributions were many, deep, and varied, and she will be missed dearly. And I'm sure I'm not the only one who has experienced this. The passing of a dear friend makes us all stop and pause and reflect where are we 
on our life's journey. How are we doing with respect to fulfilling our goals and aspirations? Are we still on track? Are we taking one step forward, two steps back? Or have we fo fully forgotten them altogether? Probably a little bit of everything, depending on the day we may be checking in with ourselves. <laughs> I think today there are so many demands on our time, our energy, and our resources that it's easy to forget what's really important. We get caught up in life's momentum. I know here, living at an ashram, I know people come and they say, we live in the real world. You're here at the ashram. Well, let me reveal a secret to you. <laughs> For those who live here all the time, it is the real world. <laughs> for us, and I know myself, who many decades ago embraced a monastic life, who never misses my daily meditation and practice. I get up in the morning, and sometimes I feel like my life has already taken off, and the rest of the day I spend trying to catch up with it. Or I wake up in the morning, and I have to resist as I'm drinking my beverage, which I always do before I sit for meditation, I have to resist turning on the computer, checking my emails, checking the news, making sure everything is still here <laughs> on planet Earth where I left it last night. And I think if I'm doing that, I can't imagine what other people are doing as well. We live a life where we're tethered. We have these invisible tethers to our cell phones. We're addicted to email. And the clock is ticking. The clock is ticking. And as it ticks, so many things that are really important, we're missing because of all the nonsense and all the passing, transient stuff that catches our attention. Let me ask you this. How many people put people on hold, loved ones that we can never find the time somehow to really spend good quality time with? How many people do that? We put people on hold, and they can disappear from view at any minute. A big lesson for me many years ago, there was a very great healer and homeopath who lived in California and helped me a lot over the years. And I wanted to give him a special gift. So I was so busy, 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 busy. It got delayed, delayed, delayed. Finally, I asked one of our master potters here to make a very special bowl for him. So that took some time. Then when the bowl was shown me, it was so big and so beautiful and so fragile, I knew it would need special packaging. And then so much time transpired until I could get around to doing that. Then it required a special trip to the post office because we're in the middle of nowhere, as you all certainly know. So that took some time. Finally, I dispatched it. The man had a sudden heart attack and passed as the gift was en route. And how many people here can share a similar experience? We put people on hold. We put feelings on hold. Unexpressed love and affection. Unresolved regrets and resentments, and we take them with us. You know how they say they can't take it, you can't take it with you? That we take with us. <laughs> and if we don't resolve them now, they'll be waiting for us at some future time to address. 
And we put our spiritual pursuits on hold. Who says, I know it's really important. I know I should do it. I really want to do it, but I don't have the time. Who says that? Well, let me clue you in. It's not about time. It's never about time. It's about priorities. Somehow, we're all ingenious when it comes to finding the time to do what's really important to us. And we have our conscious priorities, and then there are those that are sort of right below the threshold of our conscious mind. But whatever's on the top of our list, that we fulfill. So if we say, my spiritual pursuits are really important, but I don't have the time, I would urge you to reframe that. My spiritual pursuits are important to me, but there are other things that are much more important, because that's the truth. And I would pose the question to all of us. If you're here at an ashram, it means you have a really developed refined, evolved understanding. To even be here on a Saturday night listening to some five foot tall Swami give you a talk about yama and niyama, your understanding must be really out there. So you have the understanding. You have the opportunity in your life to pursue these things. And you have guidance. You, you know where to find guidance. And Gurudev used to say, make hay while the sun shines. Because we never know how long this opportunity will last. And we'll be able to do it. And this is where yama and niyama come in. And Gurudev said it beautifully. In, in his closing remarks there. And I have one little quote here from him about yama and niyama. He said, these observances help to keep the mind clean, clean, free from greed, anger, jealousy, avarice, pride. They teach you to do everything as an offering and not to return pain even when you receive pain. If you follow just one or two of these virtues, that is enough. Meditation will run to you. You don't even have to try to meditate. The mind will just become calm. And here's the interesting thing. But without these observances in your life, if you meditate, Maybe you will keep your mind under control for a little while, but when you're finished and get up, guess what? You'll be the same old person who sat down to meditate in the first place. That's the importance of yama and niyama. By working with these precepts, we come to a deeper understanding and mastery of our outer behavior our inner attitudes, the way we treat ourselves, others, and the world around us. We gain tremendous insight, which leads to personal transformation and ultimate spiritual awakening. This benefits not only ourselves. It's not a selfish endeavor. Everyone we see, everyone we meet, everything we do gets infused with that higher state of consciousness. Everyone benefits from the spiritual efforts we make. One person like Swami Satchidananda, one person like Mother Teresa, did that spiritual work, millions have benefited, millions. So at our last satsang, we began speaking about the precepts of yama and niyama, and we spoke about ahimsa, nonviolence. And what the Yoga Sutras of Patanjali says is that to one established in nonviolence, all hostilities cease in your presence. You emanate such peace that it sort of absorbs and dissolves 
any hostility in the atmosphere. The interesting thing I find about these 10 precepts is they're structured such that each one has two parts. The first part is if you perfect, and the second part is then you get. In other words, he's asking us to do something that's challenging, like be totally nonviolent, totally truthful, totally pure. It's hard. And we're just beginners. So, very skillfully, he's appealing to that part of the psyche that's secretly asking, well, what's in it for me? <laughs> Why should I put in all this effort? What do I get out of it? And that's the way they're phrased. So, moving to the next sutra on satya, truthfulness. To one established in truthfulness, actions and their results become subservient. Now, what in the world does that mean? Very abstruse language. I'll tell a little story from the Ramayana, a great epic from India. Once Sita, the wife of Lord Rama, was kidnapped and taken to Sri Lanka. Hanuman the monkey guard went to rescue her, but he too was captured, and his captors set his tail on fire. So he was screaming in pain, and Sita heard the cries, and she simply said, let the fire be cool, and it no longer burned. Due to her purity and perfection in truthfulness, she had attained the power that all she need do was speak something and it would happen. Actions become subservient to your speech. Everyone understand? Okay. Gurudev was fond of the following quote. A word is a bird. Once you let it out of the cage, you can't whistle it back. You know, so many times we'll say something in a heated moment, and then we'll go, oh, I'm sorry, I didn't mean it. Can you erase it? It's too late. It's too late. The Tirukaral says, a wound that comes from fire will heal in time, but a wound inflicted by the tongue, you'll never forget it. Whenever you see that person, there's that trace memory. Mm, he said that to me. He said that to me. He said that to me. That trace remains and colors the relationship. We have two ears always open, right? So the message the body is giving us is always be listening, open, learning, as we move through life. We have one tongue, <laughs> well protected. There's a soft gate, an ivory fortress, <laughs> and a moat. <laughs> so the message is, think thrice before you open your mouth and possibly put your foot in it. <laughs> <clears throat> if we can control the tongue, we can gain total self-mastery. The yogic teaching is we have five organs of sense, the eyes, the ears, the nose, the tongue as the taster, and the sense receptors on the skin. So seeing, hearing, smelling, tasting, touching. And we have five organs of action. The hands, the feet, the organ of elimination, the organ of procreation, and the tongue, the organ of speech. So there's only one organ that is both an organ of sense and an organ of action. This mischievous little fellow. 
And because it's situated like that, it plays a pivotal role in our subtle physiology, in life in general, and our spiritual pursuits. And if we can master the tongue, we can gain mastery over everything. So how do we gain control over this little fellow? Well, it's subtle. It's not a black and white thing. Typically, we think of truthfulness as having words correspond accurately to events, to thoughts and actions. But in the yogic thinking, it's a little more subtle. Again, the Tarukaro states, truthfulness is saying that which has not the least bit of evil in it. And falsehood will be counted as truthful if it produces flawless good, which means if it brings benefit to someone and harm to no one. So you get the subtlety there? It has to also abide by ahimsa, nonviolence, to be considered truthful. So how to understand that? There's a classical story about a hermit who lived in the woods. And one day, this beautiful young woman, bedecked in jewels, comes running up and says, help me, help me. There is this wild fellow chasing me. He has a machete. He wants to kill me and rob me of my jewels. And without even asking permission, she dove into the dark corner of the hut. And sure enough, in a few minutes, this wild-looking guy came by, brandishing a machete. And he went up to the hermit and he said, did you see a beautiful young woman bedecked in jewels? So what should he say? Should he say, well, I'm a man of truth? I should say, of course, and she's there, hiding, cowering in the corner of my hut. What would be the outcome? The fellow would kill her, kill the hermit so he didn't leave a witness. Ultimately, he would be caught and killed for the killing he had done, all in the name of truthfulness. So it takes discernment. Swami Venkatesananda, a brother monk of Swami Satchidananda, once said, People sometimes want to walk a spiritual path as if they get into a car. They want to go from New York to California, say. They hit the gas, they stare straight ahead, and they just go forward. He said, you can't even drive a car safely from point A to point B like that. The spiritual path is much more complicated. You have to know when to give gas, when to lift up, when to apply the clutch, when to turn right, when to turn left. It's not black and white. It's a huge palette of colors. And that requires discernment. In the Bhagavad, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> in the Bhagavad Gita, it says there are four qualities that speech should meet. It should be non-harmful or non-agitating, truthful, pleasant, and beneficial. If it's not all four, try to rephrase it. If you can't, be silent. And that's perfection of speech. So I believe in taking spiritual practice and then finding a way to incorporate it into our daily life. So this is what I did a couple of times in the past. I dedicated a month. The first week, everything out of my mouth has to be non-harmful. Second week, absolutely truthful. Third week, pleasant. Fourth week, beneficial. And then I did a fifth week because I'm always ready for a challenge, all four. 
I can tell you that fifth week, I was very, very quiet. <laughs> and it was interesting for me to discover what, which week was most difficult for me. Like, who would think for yourself, it being non-harmful would be the most difficult? Who would think that? Non-truthful? Pleasant, beneficial. That it would be difficult? Yeah, the most difficult. For me, the most difficult was pleasant. Every single, I didn't have trouble with being harmful or truthful or beneficial, but every single thing I would say would have to be pleasant. <laughs> There's no complaining. No venting, no gossip, nothing. Everything has to be totally pleasant. It was a surprise how challenging that was. But I will tell you, if you're interested in trying this, it's really a profound exercise because the main way we interact with one another is through speech. So, you learn about relationships. You learn about communication. And you begin to be able to hear the speech behind the speech, the unspoken intention behind the grosser utterance of the words. Do you know what I'm describing here? You just tune in to a deeper level. And I'll share with you one other thing. What I experienced, I think I had done this two series, so two months at different times. But what I experienced was, again, much to my own surprise, was that a small amount of our speech is about conveying information. And what it seemed like to me was most of our speech, what people were saying, was something along the lines of, can you see me? Are you really hearing me? Do you care about me? Is what I'm saying important for you? Do I matter? in this relationship. And that's pretty profound. And what I discovered is that's what most of us are talking about a great deal of the time, no matter what we're chattering about externally. So, shall I stop or go on? Okay, I'll just do the next one, Ashteya. This is non-stealing. And it says, to one established in non-stealing, all wealth comes. Who wants to be rich? <laughs> this is the secret. And the way it works, you can think of it this way. If you've ever seen a child running around a room, and then maybe someone wants to have that beautiful gift of that child's energy and presence close to them. And they try to grasp the child and put the child on their lap. What will that child do? <laughs> Get out of there as soon as it can. But on the other hand, if you sit there peacefully, content, not grasping, that child will be drawn to you and cuddle up come sit with you. Everything is similar. Wealth is like that too. You stop grasping, trying to take it in unrighteous ways, it will find its way to you. Basically, there are five types of interactions in life based on percentages. The first, you take 100% and you give nothing. That's what we call a thief, someone who's stealing. The second, you take 
you give back 50. That's called a debtor. The next, you take 100%, you give 100%. That's a good businessman. Then, the next, you take 50, but you give 100. That's a righteous person. In the last category, you take nothing, and you give 100%. That's a saint. <laughs> now, no one's expecting us to become saints overnight, but what's useful about this is it gives us a way to reflect what category do I seem to function in most of the time? Am I always taking more as I move through life from others than I'm giving? Do I always want, in a way, in exchange, well, I'll do this for you, what are you going to do for me? Or do I always try to give a little more than I get? And just try to move up a category and increase generally, gradually. Bhagavad Gita says, Tiaga Chanti Ranantaram. Swami Satchidananda translated it as the dedicated, those who give 100% all the time, ever enjoy supreme peace, therefore live only to serve. So, stealing doesn't make sense because there's a consciousness everywhere that notes what's going on. And if we take something that's not due to come to us, it gets rectified, either by nature's law or our own conscience brings it out. Tarukarol again says, what is not destined to be yours will not stay even if you guard it. What is destined to be yours won't leave even if you throw it away. <laughs> the way we have a destiny with people, we have destinies with wealth, possessions with everything. There's a story about a milkman who one day <clears throat> developed a business plan about how he could increase his profits. He had a gallon of milk. He added a gallon of water. Now he had two gallons of milk. He made his deliveries all month, and at the end of the month, he went to collect the revenue. He was coming home feeling, wow, I did it. I have twice as much money as I normally would. And he had to cross a river to go home. And the river happened to be flooding. And as he was walking past the river, he got tossed. So he got to the other side, immediately checked his money belt. Lo and behold, what did he find? Half the money was gone. And he's sitting there bemoaning his fate, where a saintly person came by and said, what's happening, sir? What's the problem? And the milkman said, you don't understand. I'm a milkman. I've been working all month making deliveries. This was my collection day, and I lost half the money. And the saint said, oh, sir, you shouldn't feel bad at all. Everything is really quite in order. You still have all the milk money. The water returned to the water. <laughs> and that's what happens. That's what happens. Nature corrects things. Gurudev told a story about his great uncle, who was a village elder. And in the village, they had a chicken thief. And no one knew who was stealing all the chickens. So they decided to have a big town meeting. And at the meeting, his uncle said, if the real chicken thief will come forward now and ask forgiveness, the slate will be wiped clean. Please come forward. No one came forward. So the uncle said, well, we have nothing else to do. Meeting adjourned. So they all got up. They're walking out with their backs to him. And he says, aha! I know who the chicken thief is. There's a feather in his hair. What did the guilty conscience do? <laughs> 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 so 
So if something's not meant to be yours, it will leave. And the other side, if something is meant to be yours, even if you throw it away, it will keep coming back. In 1981, I was transferred from California to our Connecticut ashram. Someone showed me to my room. On the dresser was a dresser scarf. You all know what a dresser scarf is? This thing? It was ugly. <laughs> It was this maroon color with like irises planted on it. It was painted on it. It was really, really ugly. But I wanted to honor the gift, so I let it stay there for a week. And then we had a boutique, a place where we put things we didn't want. Maybe someone else could use it. So I quietly slipped it in there. I had moved to Connecticut in August. This was the year we were packing up the ashram because we were all going to move to Virginia. So we had a skeleton crew. We had very little money. Christmas time comes. So what the people in charge decided to do was to assign some people to be elves to go to the boutique, pick out the best, best items. You can imagine what kind of boutique this was, and wrap them up as Christmas gifts. There we are Christmas morning. I opened my first gift. <laughs> that was my special gift. Now, if the story ended there, it wouldn't be remarkable. And I am not making this up. The following August, I was transferred to this ashram. I remember I arrived at 108 in the morning. I thought, this is really auspicious. And some dear soul had stayed up to show me to my room. <laughs> I'm taken to my room. I kid you not. On the dresser <laughs> was that exact same horrifically ugly dresser scarf. We had a destiny that bound us together. It, you know that game Highlight? The ball is on like a rubber band and you keep throwing it away and it keeps snapping back. Anyway, I once told this story many years ago in a Raja Yoga class I was teaching for TT and I don't know how these people did it, but the next day in my mailbox, there were 15 versions of a maroon colored dresser scarf with flowers on it. I am not saying this to motivate anyone, <laughs> just, just to share. So, but the point of this is, stealing doesn't make sense. The universe knows what we've earned, what we deserve, it's already waiting. It's in line to come to us. And what is not destined to be ours, it doesn't matter what we do. Even if we grab hold of it temporarily, it won't stick. So I'm going to give you a few things that you can think about with respect to stealing, with respect to your own life. Because again, when the rubber meets the road, it gets very subtle. So, simple. Do I take things that don't belong to me? Do I use things that don't belong to me or without asking permission? I remember the year I was working on Ashtaya one month. I was living at the San Francisco IYI. So we have communal bathrooms. I had forgotten my shampoo. I'm soaking wet. There are people walking in the hallways. I need to wash my hair. I forgot my shampoo. There are about 10 different tubes of shampoo and conditioner there. The agony I went through in my mind, can I take them? What if I run out immediately afterwards and tell the person I did it. And I'm going, no, I didn't ask permission beforehand. And then I'm thinking, well, that's green shampoo, red shampoo, blue shampoo. I have blue shampoo. I can take the blue, then quickly put my blue shampoo in there, 
the mind is working over time how to resolve this. And when I was practicing at Gurudev's suggestion, I had a consequence if I slipped in my resolve that I was doing for the day. And again, I'm sort of an overachiever. My consequence was if I slipped, I'd have to fast all day. So I figured dirty hair was better than fasting all day. <laughs> But I'm saying this because it gets subtle, like you go to health food stores and they have the munchie jar, or they used to, many health food stores, because they know people are stealing as they're sampling the goods as they move through the place. It's stealing. Okay, more subtle. Do I present the ideas of others as if they were my own? Or do I credit the source? Yeah. Do I steal the time of others by being late, by not preparing well for appointments, meetings, trips, excursions? Do I steal the time of others because I didn't prepare? Do I steal the time of others by not following up on commitments that I make? It's theft. And then finally, if you think about it, each of us is given, without our asking, every moment the breath of life by Mother Nature. If we then don't give something back through loving kindness, through service, through helpfulness, however we can, we are debtors because we're being given everything we need to survive and even flourish in abundance. So, something to think about and to tie up to where we started this talk. First, I'd like to really recommend I would feel this time on my part was well served if you just consider the precepts of yama niyama, one virtue, one good quality that you can work on and spend some time every day working on it. It will change you, and by changing you, change part of the world and send out ripple effects beyond what we can see to change everything for the better. And a good, simple way to practice it, think of the good quality you want to develop. There's usually a negative quality that you're trying to overcome. You've all learned the alternate nostril breathing. When you inhale, visualize along with the breath, you're drawing into yourself unlimited quantities of that good quality, like faith, okay? As you exhale, along with the breath, fear is leaving. I tell you, if you do it every day, twice a day, for five to 10 minutes, for a month, you will see a shift. You will see a shift. If it's something really deep-rooted you want to overcome, it may take time. But I can tell from personal experience and from observation of others, the technique is infallible because it combines concentrated mind with prana, pure energy. It's the most powerful combination in the world. You can effect miraculous transformations in this simple mechanical process. Take it with you. And final thought. The cycle of life is such that people are with us for a while. They enrich our journey. They expand our minds. They deepen our hearts in ways we would have never known possible. And I think the greatest tribute we can offer them in their memory would be to commit to live our lives a little better 
in their name. I think their eternal souls will be so happy and will also receive some of the benefit from our practice done in their name. So may we all practice well, realize the benefits, and then share them with one and all for the good of one another, for the good of our planet, and for the benefit and well-being of all creation. Om Shanti Shanti Shanti. Thank you.